Can I just lay my cards on the table about President Trump? Because um, I, I actually really like the guy. They know that a lot of the stuff they've said about him is just demonstrably, obviously false. And yet they've still persisted with this narrative because they're playing politics and they don't realise the corner they've backed us into. Because what they've done is painted him and his supporters as full-blown Benito Mussolini style fascism, right? This is the guy who used to bury you in the desert if you disagreed with him, you know what I mean? Mm. Hole in your head, hole in the floor, you go in it. They're forcing me to constantly defend the right wing all the time because they are sleepwalking into full-blown authoritarianism. We, we, and we are at Orwell now. Matt, how are you, brother? Chris, it is fantastic to see you again. How the devil? Yes, I've, I've been looking forward to this. Um, I like to, to hear Mr Angry Bootneck shouting on YouTube because it makes me feel not alone. The only thing I would say is for our American brothers and sisters listening, bootneck means marine, like, jar, like leather, leather neck, right? Jarhead, this kind of thing. So... Um, the only thing is, Matt, I've been an angrier bootneck than you this <laughs> last month. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, you don't seem quite as sanguine as me about the whole uh, the last the events of the last twelve months. Um, I suppose with me, I'm a man of um, humour is underlying everything I do. My my channel's not as serious as yours. Ultimately, mine's sort of comical news. Really, it's a lot of swearing and um, you know rants. And I try to approach things in a more humorous way, even though it appears like the world appears to be almost ending on us. Uh, I, I do try at least to, to chuckle as the world burns around me. So maybe I come across a little bit more sanguine than you for that reason, right? Mate, I'm going to be honest. I said this to you last time. You know so many big words that I don't know. Sanguine. <laughs> is sanguine mean like a bit cooler, a bit like yeah. calmer? Yeah. Okay. I thought sanguine was an area in Afghanistan where you got, you know, lots of landmines. <laughs> sanguine, yeah, sanguine. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, I think it's, I believe it's linked to um, blood. Might be Latin because I know from watching and reading a lot of detective novels and TV shows, exsanguinated is when you lose all of the blood from your body. Yes. So maybe sanguine is when you're not, you know, your blood's not up. Yes, Sang sangue, isn't it? That's Latin for blood. Or there you go then, you know Spanish more Latin or... than me. So let's dive in, mate, with a bit of um, stuff about the American election, um, about President Donald Trump and the now President Joe Biden. Um, I was very surprised to hear you no longer live in the good old land of the USA. That is true. That is true. I, uh, I moved back. Last month, I believe it was the 4th of January, I booked my ticket for. Um, uh, I took a job offer from a large multinational corporation. Uh, I don't like talking about work too much because in these insane times, you can be a socially liberal, reasonable chap like me and they'll still attempt to get you fired if you, if you make a joke or a quip out of, out of touch. So uh, let's just say I moved for a, a, a job offer with a large corporation. That is the predominant reason. It, it wasn't because I was fleeing America, terrified. <laughs> I heard right. that you were hacked off, that Borat didn't win the election. <laughs> well, I was hacked off with the election, but that's not why I moved. I would be lying to say it didn't play a role. Like, if everything was going tickety-boo in the United States, I probably would have went, eh, I don't think I'll take the gig. But it was a culmination of things. It, it, I would be lying if I said it didn't play a role, but I was out there for eight years. Eight years, a long time. I settled in and I enjoyed it and I got my citizenship. So, um, you know, collecting passports in these uh, uncomfortable times is probably quite a good idea. So I thought, hey, do mate, that. you're you're, you're going to be getting a passport. It won't be the type of passport you 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 you'd want, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't be... start on that. Don't start on that. Yeah. yeah, the jab, the jab passport. Hey, I'm I'm going to do a video on that. Have you seen the film Idiocracy? 
Of course, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a cult classic, right? Yeah. Um, I decided to do like a reaction video to it. Somebody mentioned it the other day and I said, you know what? That's all, that really is all come true, isn't it? Society has become so dumbed down that you actually have to explain to people you can't put Gatorade on the crops. It's not good. It's good. You can drink that shit, but you can't put it on the crops. It won't work. Right. You know what you've reminded me of there, though? That Back to the election. Um, you remember when um, there was a billionaire, um, Bloomberg, from New York, when he entered the race? And he really is one of these society meddling, arrogant elites who doesn't really know anything about blue collar workers and yet is arrogant enough to think he can rule the entire world. And he was famously uh, giving a speech and they asked him about uh, making crops and stuff, you know, and he was basically saying how oh, the world's going to change. And he went on this like mad little segue saying, everyone knows how to make crops. You dig a hole, you put some seeds in there, you put a bit of water on and you got a shit ton of crops. And I think the farming community the world over was thinking, Probably a bit more work than that, you absolute penis. Like, you know, just the, the, they are insane. The, the, I think the real problem we're in now with these elites is that for too long we've had it too good. And we have believed that if you're successful, you are the man who, showed, who should show us the way. And what the capitalist system's obviously done is allowed people to make massive amounts of money with almost no talent at all. You know, there's people out there who have, Mitt Romney is a fantastic example. He's a venture capitalist. You know, these sort of awful groups of people who come together, a load of rich guys, buy up a company in some small town. They did it with the, um, the outdoor store in um, America. One of the biggest outdoor stores sells, you know, hunting and fishing equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, and they basically move to one of those places, identify a big business that's selling something like that, and then set up next door to them and sell everything at a much cheaper price. Do it for six months operating at a loss until they go bankrupt and everybody loses the job. And then, you know, bulldoze it and rack your prices up because there's no alternatives. And these venture capitalists do that across America. Uh, you know, our system is, you can manipulate it if you're wealthy and powerful. And there's tons of people, tons of people who've not got any real world skills at all, right? I mean, even look at the likes of Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Doorstop, my man Doorstop off Twitter. What's he going to do in reality? What's he really good at other than tech stuff? If he was stuck on a desert island, who's going to be more useful, you or him? You know, but we've decided because he's made billions of dollars, he is the guru. And he should teach us how to do everything. It doesn't matter whether it's farming, medical supply, logistics, banking. They're like, no, no, that person's made a ton of money. Let's get their advice for everything. And I think that's what's gone wrong in the world. We really have turned a reverence that's undeserved upon these people. Um, and I think I mentioned it last time to you. Remember when Michael Gove said people have had enough of experts? Yes. He was, he was right, wasn't he? He was right. We all laughed at him, myself included, because on the face of it, it sounds so stupid. But he was right. We've, we live in a society where all you have to be is hyper successful. And we think, right, they can show us the way. And all the people that have been showing us the way have done for the last 50 years is fuck everything up. That's why we're at, we are where we're at now, isn't it? Has it gone well the last 50 years? I mean, really? Well, it, I think we said this last time is, oh, sorry, I keep going out of focus. That, that, it's quite ironic. I've got vertigo at the moment as well. This is how ang angry I was earlier, right? My poor little boy, he got a mouthful, bless him. Um, I got tinnitus in my freaking ears, right? So I've got this annoying ringing 24-7. On top of that, don't ask me how I got... I've got vertigo this week, right? So, so everything's like I'm drunk. <laughs> So my ears are ringing. I'm 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 falling all over the place like a bloody a drunk on the Titanic. Um, and I can't remember. I was just going to tie that in with being really angry. Oh, and on top of it, <laughs> on top of it, I tried to have a nap earlier, and my little boy came in, kung fu kicked the door open. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> then you went mental. Yeah. And and I, Daddy had a moment. Yeah, I, I have had to apologise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's um, it, it's understandable. Pet tempers afraid, and well, I've been uh, trying to do that on my channel. You know, try and encourage people to have a chat and send each other messages and sort of try and form a community around it. Because even this, I'm enjoying it because you know we're not really living how human beings are supposed to be living. We're a pack animal. You know, everyone's seen the movie Castaway where he goes completely off his tits after about six months mm -hmm. and he's having lengthy conversations with his ball. It's like, we really do need human contacts. We're a pack animal. We evolved this way. And, and this is what the, my point I've made. I don't want to segue into the whole lockdown thing, but um, we know for a fact that there are enormous consequences to denying people the freedom, the liberties. Matt, and there's that enormous is... consequences to let some corporate sociopath literally bend you over and shove something up your jacksie. <laughs> That's the latest one. I've heard there might be anal swabs. Right. Yeah, even and... my morale may take a plummet if I'm getting anally swabbed. <laughs> Let's... Um... You know, we have to be quite careful what we say, but let's talk about just society in general. And then let's get back to the election. <laughs> yeah, we've <laughs> segued there. But like, just, that's why I'm going to do this reaction video on idiocracy, because you just couldn't have a dumber society than what we've got at the moment. It's There isn't even any logic to it. Well, I'll tell you, I can, I can get this back onto the election by explaining to you how I see it taking place across the, the pond, right? Um, the term Orwellian is overused. Um, idiocracy, it's overused. You know, for the last couple of decades, we've been using it. And when Trump won the election, all the lefties were going, oh, it's idiocracy. You know, we've got an idiot in charge. But um, I think we've got to the point now, due to 30 years of um, relative happiness, safety, Everyone's got Netflix. Everybody's got plenty to eat. When you've got all of those pressing concerns, the type of things that we needed to worry about when we were chimps, right? Well, we still are apes. But what I'm saying is when we were in the, the wilderness, yes, you, you got, you've got pressing concerns. You've got, to, you've got to feed yourself. You've got to get water. You've got to clean yourself. You've got to get shelter. When all that stuff sorted out, we start pissing around. And we've been so comfortable for so long. It has allowed, I think, finally, we're getting to that spot where Orwellian is, it's happening, right? Uh, we've, we have all been guilty of overusing the term 1984 Orwellian. We overuse the, the term, but I believe that we are at a place now, probably caused by big political earthquakes like Trump and Brexit. But um, we're at that point now where it is taking place right before our eyes, isn't it? And again, I'm not a conspiracy theory, and I keep saying all the mad shit that's gone on lately. Now I'm the guy going, holy shit, Alex Jones was right. Like, I watched him on Rogan's podcast, and it was basically Rogan fact-checking everything he said, and 90% of it was, was pretty much in there, was around the periphery of what we're talking about. And, and I believe it's that. I think that playing politics in this relatively comfortable environment we've created, where people are you're not going to take to the streets and risk getting shot in the face if your kids are well-fed, your wife's well-fed, your medical needs are taken care of. So they've got more and more bold thinking we can just keep on taking the piss more and more outrageously and people are not going to do it. They're not going to take to the streets because we're still pretty, pretty comfortable. And I think 2021 might start to be that tipping point because they've got this confidence now after playing politics calling Trump a Nazi and a fascist, even though they know he isn't. Biden and AOC and the like, they know he isn't. There's a dictionary definition for a fascist or a Nazi. You can say all kinds of things about Trump. You can say he's narcissistic, he's arrogant, he's not very well-spoken, but he's none of the things they called him. And because they've dragged political discourse through the sewer and been calling the guy all these names, they've now pathologized tens of millions of Americans into thinking that any and all measures are now acceptable to dealing with him. And this is how you get all well, Orwellian societies. And I believe we are there now. Have you seen all of the laws that have passed in the last couple of weeks? The executive orders and the like. Oh, the way that they're reversing. Can I just lay my cards on the table about President Trump? Because um, I, I actually really like the guy. <laughs> yeah. Generally speaking, when the, where there's public outcry about 
any situation. I, I'm usually the polar opposite. I usually find everyone, everyone who's not really that worldly wise will jump on the, he's a racist, he's a this, let's, let's yeah. stay, stay in the EU. They, they, they tend to go with the, the crap narrative. Yeah. And I've seen, um, I don't do, for anybody listening, I've never voted, I never will. The idea that I will go into a voting booth and vote for my own slavery is probably about the most cretinous suggestion I think you could ever come up with. If you think I'm going to vote my son into slavery, I'm going to boff you on the in the face, Mister. Right? It's not going to happen. I'm. Well, that's Russell you. Brand. Russell Brand always said that, didn't he? That you're not. It's not worth voting. Hey, I do vote, gonna... but I do think that. Um, Ultimately, you can see why people don't, because it really is a situation of who do we detest the least? There's never anybody who you actually like, is there? No. Um, never. No. And, and it's also funny in America because the people always vote for, for the guy that's just a little bit more handsome than the other one. I don't know why <laughs> yeah. that is, but... Charisma is important, isn't it? But I've seen a lot of the old stuff about Donald Trump before he was president and some of the old interviews... In and you've got to give this guy credit. He was very genuine. And he, you know, I, I always focus on the person that is genuinely passionate about their country, not the guy that's just saying stuff that he's been told to say, some, some you know, some, some, some sort of cliche. Um, um, Bill, was it Build Back Better? Oh God, don't don't get me started. I, I don't I don't watch mainstream TV, Matt, so I probably uh, don't know what I'm talking about. But well, uh, uh, regards Trump, though, I wasn't saying I hated the guy. What I'm saying is that if you're gonna be critical, you can pick plenty of things about him that you would be critical about, yeah. as with any politician. But what I'm saying to you is, they know that a lot of the stuff they've said about him is just demonstrably, obviously false. And yet they've still persisted with this narrative because they're playing politics and they don't realise the corner they've backed us into. Because what they've done is painted him and his supporters as full-blown Benito Mussolini-style fascism, right? This is the guy who used to bury you in the desert if you disagreed with him, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Hole in your head, hole in the floor, you go in it. And they've been calling him that for the last four years. And now they are doing exactly what... Orwell and the like. Alan Moore. Did you ever see the movie V for Vendetta? I did a long time ago. I won't pretend I can. It's well, when he started wearing the masks, wasn't it? That is, yeah. But he's a proper, proper lefty, Alan Moore. And and, and he's gone quite the last few years because I bet you he's sitting there going, my God, it's us. Because this is what's happened. They've, they have made the virtue signaling, the, the sort of pathological social justice activism to such a degree where these people are absolutely 100% convinced that they are just and moral and will never go too far. And the people they're fighting against are evil, deplorable. It's Clinton's words, not mine. They honestly believe that if you don't agree with them, you're a vile person and they are sleepwalking into authoritarianism. And I've been making this point since I started my YouTube channel. I'm not right wing. I'm center left on most issues. I'm a liberal person. But they're forcing me to constantly defend the right wing all the time because they are sleepwalking into full-blown authoritarianism. We, we, and we are at Orwell now, but it is not like what everybody expected, Alan Moore and the like. It's not the right that are doing it, it's the left. Because they've gone too far and they are convinced that any actions they take against their enemies are morally justified. And the right wing, no, that's not the case. The, the tiny minority of people in the world that are, actual racists, full-blown racists. It is minuscule in this day and age because we've had a good education system, teaching a liberal education system, certainly since I was a child. All I ever learned in the 80s and the 90s was to never judge anybody, take everybody as an individual. There is no full-blown, especially in England, probably a small number in America. And because of that, we don't really have many of those people. And the ones that are, are fully aware that most people don't agree with them and they have somewhat contemptible views, especially on race and stuff, where they think, I don't even know this random person, and I'm going to make 
judgments that are demonstrably false and ridiculous based off their immutable characteristics. So the, the, the real issue there is the right wing know that the far right know that nobody likes them. And they know that nobody has any time for extremism. When Joe Cox got her head blew off, nobody went, ah, yeah, well, she sort of deserved it, though. Nobody thinks that. Nobody in the entire right of politics in the UK thinks that. And nobody thinks you should be judging people by the colour. But the left are convinced that absolutely everyone that disagrees with them is a full-blown racist, makes Nick Griffin look like Santa Claus, despises people for their immutable characteristics. And when that is, when you've squared that circle in your head, why would you show restraint? If you're 100% convinced that the other side of the aisle are evil, well, you might as well, you might as well lock them in the gulag. And do you, AOC, seriously, she would toss you in the salt mines, eat the key and sleep like a baby. You can see these people, they are pathological. So now I'm here constantly defending a group of people who typically I probably wouldn't agree with on loads of things, especially in the United States, because in the United States, it is different from England, right? Conservatism in the United States is inexorably linked to religion. And to most British people, we've got no time for that. That's why we don't naturally lean right. We naturally lean left. We're a liberal people. We're, I mean, just look at the British attitude towards things like gambling, boozing, vice. The American conservatives are never down with any of that. English conservatives are liberal people. We think you should never judge anybody by their immutable characteristics. If you don't do any harm to anybody else, have at it. You don't meet many homophobic British people. You don't meet many racist British people. We're, we're a socially liberal country, and we have been for decades. So, But they made this boogeyman and said, oh, my God, our opponents are vile. David Lammy went on television and said, Jacob Rees-Mogg is worse than the Nazis. And when you get rhetoric like that, why would those people feel guilty if they throw you in, a, in, a, in the gulag? Why would they feel guilty? I mean, the Nazis literally shovel babies into gas chambers. And David Lammy, with a straight face, goes on TV and says to Andrew Marr, oh, yeah, but Jacob Rees-Mogg's worse than a Nazi. I mean, you, you can't make that up. I, I, I could show you, but I don't want to segment him going into videos and stuff. But yeah, Andrew Marr said to him, what, why are you calling run-of-the-mill English conservatives, Nazis. And he said, oh, well, if anything, I didn't go far enough. That's the quote. <laughs> Seriously, normal people. Jacob Rees-Mogg, again, I can slag him off all day long. I'm a northerner. He's posh. He wears a monocle. He dresses in tweed. He's a baron or whatever. He lives in a mansion. There's lots of things that working-class people look at him and go, I don't really like that about him. And yet now you're forcing me to embrace Jacob Rees-Mogg because for all that we haven't got in common, he isn't an authoritarian status like the left are, who think, if you disagree with me, any and all powers should be introduced to have you controlled on a leash, locked in a cell, whatever they decide. And I will always defend those people, even if I disagree with them on you know, policy issues. And that's what's happened in the United States. You've got a Democrat party that is now in thrall to the very, very, very far left. Even though Joe Biden, scumbag career politician that he is, never has been. He was always a centrist, what they call a moderate. Nothing about him was far left, but they've realized the keys to unlocking the White House and beating Trump was to rouse the, to, was to rouse the rabble and they could win the election. And he's, that is an awful thing to do, just to get your hands on the, the keys to the White House, you know? Well, yeah. I, well, I was just trying to sort of lay, the, my, like, lay my table about it, uh, lay my table a bit earlier i wasn't saying that you thought trump's anything i'm i'm just trying to say for our american friends listeners i did actually i quite like the guy um yeah. i didn't compared to say that the, the uh, hillary um and her kind of record um it's almost insane that that you can consider voting for her when there's someone like Donald who, okay, he might be a bit rough around the edge, or, or, or he might appear that way. I personally, I I got to realise, and I don't think he was, you know, I think he was just a true patriot, right? And again, for anyone listening, I don't vote, so don't tie me in. You're like, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just making my observations, right? Um, and then you get this this Joe Biden character who clearly seemed years past the job 
clearly if the, if the the media clips and i know they can be selective but if they're to be believed like he didn't seem to really know what day it was um he's definitely not fit for the job not, you know, not mentally i don't know it just seemed like this president trump character came in and and he actually tried to do some good stuff although yeah. under un, they're un, obviously they're always under pressure to bomb the odd person because that they're, they're decisions that aren't really under their control, are they? Well, I mean, you have to say that Donald Trump was a roaring success when it comes to foreign policy. You have to say that. There, there, there is so much black and white evidence that that is the case. He basically did the impossible at times. The Middle East peace deal, which was brokered by uh, Jared Kushner, but under Trump's administration, um, and he has been nominated for a Peace Prize for that Nobel Peace Prize, um, was a fantastic achievement. You know, when similar things like that happened decades ago, you had u universal acclaim and, you know, six months of press about it. But now, again, because we're living in crazy post-truth era, the C CNN and all of the mainstream media other than Fox News basically tried to bury it. And BBC, Sky News, Channel 4. I mean, in England, we don't even have an alternative. Andrew Neil's starting his own, isn't he, British news, because there isn't a centrist news outlet in the UK. So nobody heard about it, but he did a Middle East, he broke a Middle East peace accord, which nobody saw coming. He did really well with that little fat mulleted North Korean that nobody saw coming. You know, he was, he was first he was like, oh, little rocket man. And they were like, oh, my God, World War Three. And a couple of months later, they're hugging it out. That's <laughs> that's a, that is a result. And you can't deny it. The media might not have wanted to talk about it, but that is a fact. And again, you can slag him off for plenty of stuff. Um, but you, if you're focusing on the facts, he did achieve a lot of things. And as you say, the, the issue is um, he's not polished. He speaks like a bloke in the pub, right? And that doesn't work in politics because for decades they've polished this system. I mean, for example, look how nuts they go when the guy swears. When he said... We've got people coming from shit all countries. What percentage of the general public do you think f routinely use a term like shit all? <laughs> it really is almost quite preposterous. And that's, I swear a lot. And, and I try to do that because I'm being honest and I'm being myself. And I think that that's one thing we need to get into politics. We need to basically get um, reality involved. And why do we put them up on a pedestal and create a total fiction there? Like, oh my God, the president said shit. So what? Everyone does it. My mother used to do it when I was eight and you'd go, oh, you're swearing. And she'd go, sorry. Everyone does it. If your mother does it, it's good enough for me. Right. And um, I find it really bizarre. It is everything about US politics in an even worse degree than ours is just fake. It's all about presenting a veneer. Um, and, you know, that's famous that too, the way that um, Nixon famously lost to, um, when Nixon lost to Kennedy, they reckon it was because he was sweating a lot and he, and he didn't mop his brow enough. Uh, you know, I watched that on Frost versus Nixon, I think. Uh, but yeah, apparently they're all about how you look, polished, charisma, you know, nicely done hair. That's why Biden's obviously had hair plugs unless he's miraculously re -go Well, he's got a load of pubes on his head, hasn't he? That, that's not painfully obvious. Uh, and that stuff's really important in the United States. They, they ask stupid questions to the opinion polls, like which president would you rather go for a beer with? And uh, I think the Brits are a little bit more savvy, aren't they? Like, we don't want to go for a beer with any of them. We just want someone who's competent. We hate our politicians, and that's fine. The Americans are, for some reason, a lot more obsessed with likability and charisma. And, and I do think the Brits have got the right of it there. We should be like, I don't give a shit. I don't care about Boris Johnson taking me for a beer. I don't want to go for a pint with the fat jellyfish. I just want him to be competent and do a good job. But in the States, it's really important. I don't know why. It's it's a mystery. Yes. I, yes, you do see people being led. You, know, you can see the manipulation in there, can't you? If, you if, if you start bringing out words like Jesus and God immediately, that's incredibly powerful in the United States. Um, but it was interesting, though, wasn't it, that you had President Trump, who was bailed out by the Rothschilds in the, was it the 90s from, from bankruptcy? Yeah. So, so you would think he's their boy, right? And then you've got the Rothschilds, who are kind of the archetypal villain in the world. <laughs> you know, 
they get the 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 you know they get dirty looks from 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 anyone who's ever been involved in any kind of research that their names come up but then but but then um he moved the united states embassy or consulate oh i've gone dizzy hang on it's weird isn't it i don't know why my camera just goes out i'm just going to keep talking so yeah he moved the u.s consulate from um uh, Tel Aviv, where I've stood outside, stood outside it a few times. Actually, I had a hotel right opposite that 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 building. Moved it from Tel Aviv into Jerusalem. So talk about a controversial, you know, move. Um, yeah, it was in Tel Aviv because moving it to Jerusalem wound them up. And then when he moved in, he's like, I don't care. We're putting it in Jerusalem. Yeah. And obviously, the um, Netanyahu thought that was a fantastic move. He said, Yep. Yeah, Brittany praised the announcement because he was like, you know, it's obviously indicating that the final status of the boards is going to be left to, you know, us to decide. And obviously it was rejected by the United Nations because they're mad globalist, ridiculous. I mean, who even knows what's going on with them at this point? The Who is another one like that. Like the Who is demonstrably taking vast sums of money from the Chinese. It's well known, we've read meeting minutes that they were told there's a virus, we should be suppressing it. And the Chinese played it down, uh, the WHO play, played it down at every chance they got. Because just like the UN, there's no trust in these institutions anymore. They've been ruined, they've been politicized. And uh, it's just another one of them. It's political rabble rousing. That was a non-story. The Americans can put their embassy wherever they want. I find it baffling, the world we're living in. Like I said, it is the post-truth era. I was listening to Tucker Carlson yesterday, and he was talking about how, um, you know, they've passed all these laws now where they can keep National Guardsmen on the streets in the United States. And they're just constantly talking about, oh, all the terrorists, the threat from within. Again, like I said, V for Vendetta. That's what they're doing. They're telling Americans that the threat is white supremacists, even though in this day and age they are as rare as rocking our shit. And if you can find me a million of them in the United States, I'd be amazed. It is, it is an ideology that has been rubbished by history and by 30 um, years of education. <laughs> but, um, yeah, of course, the, the, the controversy is it's the American embassy in Israel, in Israel, not in Palestine, in Israel. And by moving it to Jerusalem, you're you're basically stating this is this is Israel. And of course, it's it's. It's a highly Contested. contentious, yeah. highly contentious and political and, and upsetting um, issue for for very many people and quite quite rightly so. So almost all of the Muslims in the world, um, yeah, obviously. And uh, well, ultimately, you can you don't have to overcomplicate it with with recent events. So I don't understand how they've managed to make the last week's news ever since that shit show on Capitol Hill where you had a bunch of people. They tried to make it out like that was a full-blown assault on the Capitol. And it wasn't. I made a video about it. It wasn't. It was a carnival atmosphere turned into a bit of a mob. And then because a mob is only as clever as its most stupid member, a few of them started bricking the building and they all went in and caused a bit of shit. It, you can call it a riot, but it wasn't an insurrection and they weren't attempting to kill anyone. Um, and they span that to make it so they can now implement what basically looks like martial law and Washington DC looks like Iraq when I was there. And it is a scary road to go down just to get solidification of your, the keys to the White House. And this is what I was talking about, about sleepwalking into authoritarianism. They, they are now saying the biggest threat to Americans is it's balmy white supremacists who, if the death toll from white supremacists in America is in three figures from the last 10 years, I'd be very surprised. But we're expected to swallow, even in, even in England, that the big threat to us all is white supremacy. And it I think um, I'm going to have to say this, Matt, for the other, my, my, my subscribers will be spitting at me now. The biggest threat to us all is, is these fucking bastards, the Babylonians. Okay. <laughs> no. The Babylonians so, that have that have that, that have controlled the whole show for the late, last eight thousand years because they control the money 
system. You are talking about um, uh, that's a sort of geopolitical thing. I'm just talking about on a micro level. But I think until we all acknowledge as a planet that the people that control the money supply, they control all of this, all of these narratives, you know, they're, they're behind it all. They just are. If you aren't, um, again, I'm sorry, I'm not talking to you, Matt, I'm talking to people at home, but if you understand how our money system works, you understand it's got everybody and off the back of it, all these <sighs> twisted, perverted, little narratives come off that then we, the common man, spend ages, you know, <laughs> kind of getting diverted, arguing over. And, and the, these people, they're laughing at us. They are la they're absolutely laughing at us, you know. Um, I'm not suggesting that there's any, any magic uh, answer. Well, if you, if you want to talk about that, you can discuss that from the last week, right? The, uh, the short selling on um, GameStop. Did you keep on top of that? My brother explained it to me, Matt. He said that basically you had these guys that were trying to pull a clever one on the stock market, doing some insider trading and getting these shares off their mates and saying, look, we'll, we'll, we'll get these back to you, don't worry, and there, there, there'll be a beer, in, beer or two in it for you. <laughs> then they were trying to offload them onto these poor punters. And once they took them, then they were going to like hit the market and like sell, sell, sell and, and create this, this rapid um, loss of value in these shares. And then they're going to, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll just buy them back off you now. And then they're going to give them back to their original. It, am I even anywhere in the like? <laughs> Somewhere. The short version is um, they basically borrow shares, essentially, and then say, we'll give you them back in a bit. And then they rig the system so that the shares plummet in value and then they can play with them, give you back the shares they borrowed and keep all the excess, basically. So all the guys on Reddit got in there to make sure they drove the shares up. So when it's time to pay back, you have to buy them at the inflated price. And where you see that the system was rigged was when people started doing it. Uh, all of the big apps, which is what little guys like me, I've got a Robin Hood account, which I've bought a bit of stock in, you know. I bought an AMD a few years ago because I like PCs. And I thought, oh, yeah, they're making a good graphics card, a good CPU, or buy some stock. So you just put it on your phone, go on, give them a grand, and buy a grand's worth of stock. That's how the little guy does it. They're basically suspended trading. And they say, oh, my God, these, these guys on the internet are doing it. They stopped you from being able to buy. So if you've seen this on Reddit on the morning and went, oh, nice one, I'll get a couple of grand's worth of shares, you log on to Robin Hood and you're not allowed to. It says, sorry, you can't buy them shares today. So they were, that just shows how the system's rigged because when they say we're protecting our customers by stopping you from being able to buy all these shares, their customers are the hedge fund managers because they're the ones who want to stop you from buying them because that yeah. drives the price up. Yeah, so the, it was whole, a total the whole idea of shares is that you buy and sell them. Yeah, well, they stopped you from being able to buy them. Any of the ones identified from Reddit, AMC was another one, the cinema chain, Nokia, Silver. There's a few others. You just you log on your phone and you've got money in your account and you can't buy them. So we can probably, I told you, I'm, um, I'm sort of on the fence about a lot of that, the financial market stuff, but there's an obvious fact that the game is rigged for the little guy. The information, we're living in the post-truth era and whether or not you're a conspiracy theorist or not, I mean, I don't like the term because they just say that to discredit anybody who disagrees with the narrative that's on the fucking BBC. But um, the point is, you should never just discount anything out of hand. You should do your homework and make your own educated conclusion about it. I don't think you should make your mind up about anything without really doing your homework. Um, and, and that, once again, can segue us back into politics because that's what I'm telling you about what's going on in the United States. They've fully lied. They used to lie by simply omitting things. It was a lie by omission, right? There was the famous Black Lives Matter woman who was like getting interviewed by CNN and she's like, let's go to the white neighborhoods. Let's destroy their shit and proper being aggressive. And then they only take the first half of the narrative out where she's saying, I can't believe you're wrecking everything. And they cut the interview there so they don't get Instead of wrecking our shit, let's go to their neighborhood and smash their shit up. They cut the net in half and then only show you the first bit and they're lying by omission. So they're only telling you half the story. But now they just fully make shit up. Yeah, Trump's a neo-Nazi. You know, 
white supremacists are going to kill us all. Therefore, we need to have the National Guard deployed. And this is what I'm telling you. We've America has sleepwalked into authoritarianism and it's not the, the right that's done it, which everybody thought it was going to be. Orwell, Alan Moore, every great writer. It's always the right wingers who do it. And what's actually happened is the left have done it because they've convinced themselves that their opponents are evil. And if you convince yourself your opponents are evil, then you can do anything mm. to deal with them. And that was what the, the punch a Nazi thing. Do you remember that? The what? Punch sorry, a the... punch a Nazi. Do you remember when that was the little mantra? Punch a Nazi. I, I vaguely remember. See, I'm big on on the you you know you know I'm always big on the overarching agenda. And when you when you when you read Orwell or you watch the film or whatever your thing is, you can see that the 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 facilitator in all of this is is the the natural like human i, I don't want to say vulnerabilities it, it but that makes it sound all softy softy i don't mean that i mean the the an, the a, <clears throat> it's the animal a, animalisms in us that come these you know we, we can go from being happy lovely lovey people get beyond the wheel of a car bang like that you, you 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 you're plotting to get this guy in front assassinated and wondering <laughs> who who you can pay to take you, you know it, we we're very manipulative in our animalistic kind of natures and what when you see it in this and there's a classic example I'm going to be discussing this book next week with uh, Rich Willett um, just because of how all the all the direct parallels to what's going on in society now but. The, the one in this with the two minutes of hate where every day for two minutes, you got to hate the, yeah. you know, hate yeah. Emmanuel, Go Emmanuel Goldstein or something. You've got to hate the enemy, this fictitious enemy that doesn't even exist. you got to right go. Well, when did we have a two minutes where everyone went outside recently and they had to have an outpouring of emotion, right? It, I know, it, I know. You can't, you can't write this shit, you know? So, I mean, it is all coming true, isn't it? It's all coming true. We're and living so my, in a fascinating time. My thing is, is even though it's coming from the left and I completely get your point, Matt, the fuckers up there are steering the left. It's it, it, it's a puppet show, you know? They're, they're just dropping the seeds. They, they, they know human emotion, right? It's like I say, they've done it for eight thousand years. They they know, um, you know, they they it's it's they just understand. They understand how the brain works, how the hemispheres in the brain, how the glands in the brain secrete shit. They understand the planets, the fucking moons, the solar systems, the weather, pressure systems, uh, astrology. <laughs> you know, it it they're they're fucking just so clever. And Ultimately, they, do you think it's that hard to understand? I honestly don't. Like, I think I talked to you about this last time. Uh, you know, if you read about um, human evolution, I don't think we're that hard to figure out. We're not. We're, a, we're an evolved ape with an adrenal gland that's too big and a frontal lobe that's too small, and we're very easy to manipulate, and, and, and we're included in that, right? I mean, it is. We're easy to manipulate. Um, well, that's the problem. Yeah. That's why it's not that weird. When they say, oh, it's a conspiracy, it's like, it's not that weird, is it? Because we are easy to manipulate. We are, the human is easy to point at something. If it and wasn't, say, uh, the reason I'm always banging on about this, Matt, is if it wasn't for like this actual book and a few other things, you know, if you read history, you do see patterns of stuff repeating itself, don't you? Right? Like the the great. Any time you put the word great in something, it's a communist manifesto. The the, the great leap forward, the great yeah. reset, you know, the the the, the great oppression, all, all these. You, it's usually some some communist propaganda move and lo lots of people are going to get get dead right but it's when something that was written in 1948 comes true to a t in 1984 or, or, or 2020 as we know then it's like that's where you see that there's something more to this than this is just the this is just the natural play of things. You know, humans are crap. We're a big monkey and we're a stupid monkey. Do, do you know what I'm saying? This is uh, yeah. This well, is that's why the greats are so revered, isn't it? Because the likes of Orwell, um, it is fascinating reading them. 
I actually did just read him. Like last month, I did uh, The Road to Wigan Pier because it was recommended to me. And um, it's fascinating. You're reading it and you're like, whoa, he wrote this like, you know, 70 years ago. Um, and it's just accurate. Every, this is why, the, the, you know, the greats are revered because they are. Could you give us a, a, a precy on what that's about then? Oh, have you never have you never heard of the book? When I hear of Wigan Pier, I think Wigan Casino, the old mods and rockers and stuff, wasn't it? You know, <laughs> Northern Soul. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, the road to Wigan Pier, he sort of talks about how um, he, he lives with um, Northern families, rough towns up north, like who, who did the mining. And he talks at length about how disgusting it was, like how hard it was. And um, I, I really wanted to read it because um, a lot of people swear blind that George Orwell's like sort of far left. And if he was alive now, he'd be like AOC. And, and you read that book and he's so scornful and contemptuous of the sort of bourgeois left that we now have running the world. The people like AOC, the people like, look at them in England. Jess Phillips, all of these lefty MPs, they're all staggeringly middle class. And Orwell, first of all, it talks about, it's like with Lancashire and Yorkshire and how rough it is. And it is unbelievable the way those people have to live. Makes you feel happy to be alive in this day and age. Like, Sorry, you know, Matt, can I, excuse my ignorance, was The Road to Wigan Pier written by Orwell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, oh God. Um, see, this is it. I'm, I'm actually not that educated. I, I just... I just know a few bits and bobs. Do you know what I mean? Right. I, yeah. I know that he. I know that he wrote down and out in Paris and London. Yeah. Well, this isn't as famous, probably because it's fucking depressing, <laughs> right? It's depressing. The fictional stuff, like Animal Farm or Night Eighty Four, is a bit more like, "Well, this is cool." But uh, Rod Wigan P is factual, and he spends the first half of the book. He's in the north, living with coal miners, and it is just like, "Holy shit! I cannot believe people live like that." And then the second half of the book, he is literally just whinging about bourgeois middle-class arseholes who constantly talk about how much they care about the working class. But really, they care about themselves. Yeah, this is where his kind of, in, in, in 1984, he talks about the proles, the proletari proletariat, doesn't he? The working yeah. class. And he, he was very passionate about them because they just like get on with it. They don't yeah. question their lot. They're highly oppressed, but they don't, because they, it's all they've ever known, they don't really understand that they're depressed. And, and this is why Trump won, right, to get it back on US politics. The reason Trump won is very, very simple. And, and it's the same why Brexit happened. Why all the middle class, the, 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 power, the powers that be, the people that run the world, couldn't see it at all. It, it amazed them. Because they were like, we control the narrative, we control the news, we control history. You know, like Orwell says, there's just an endless present and the party's always right. Mm -hmm. So they were astounded when Trump won, Brexit happened, um, the referendum went our way, uh, Brexiteers, sorry. Um, and they were so astounded because it would be like the equivalent of 1984, the party being wrong, the party allowing the people to have a say. And the reason it happened is very simple. And it's because of that. It's because the middle class elites, all of them, CNN, Channel 4. Have you seen the numbers for the BBC staff? Something like 6% of them were like from a, went to a normal comprehensive or something. It's ridiculous. Like white men who went to a comprehensive school. It's in single figures, percentage wise. Um, they, they are the upper class, the, the elites. It's The Guardian, Channel 4, BBC, Sky News. None of those people represent the working classes. They just say they represent the working classes. And what the working classes like is honest, decent, socially liberal, but patriotic people that like the country, like the people that live in it, and, and they do not. Talking about social distancing, I don't know who said it right, but I heard on Brendan O'Neill's uh, Spike podcast, the, the wealthy have been social distancing for decades. They have. They do not have anything in common with people like you and me. And they just think they can spew out diktats from the top, use the BBC and Sky News to brainwash us. And whatever they tell us, Brexit bad, Trump bad, we'll just go along with it. And the people said, no, no, we're not doing it. Because you are, I mean, they're condescending, if nothing else. I don't like any of these people, Boris Johnson and the like, but I was like, who's going to piss you off the most? I'll vote for them. Uh, and it's, uh, again, I'm not the solution because 
I'm, I'm well aware you vote, you don't vote and I do. And I've bought in with thinking somehow we can change things. Probably can't. But I do like politics, so I vote. Um, I agree with Mark Twain said, right? If voting made a difference, they wouldn't let us do it. Well, let, let Matt, that's a great opportunity to dive in there and say, um, like, to me, and I, I, I don't know how we stand on YouTube saying this sort of stuff, so I don't want to be incendiary, but you look at that election and as, as a logical, rational, calm thinking, you think, fuck me, that was, that was fixed. You know, that was clear. Who'd vote for that? Say it. You know, Who the say hell it. would vote for that guy over that dude? Okay, yeah. I, I get it. This guy's got some rough edges and he's upset a few people, but the, it, it, it was the same with the, the Hillary thing. Do you not know this person's history? I know. I Everyone know. that comes into contact with them allegedly dies on railway tracks, you know? It, <laughs> yeah. It, 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 Seth Rich, did you read about that guy? The one who was uh, mugging and they didn't steal anything and shot him in the back. Oh, there I've is some that. mad stuff. So, I mean, and I've never been into any of this. The stuff you go on about is a bit too far down the rabbit off me. I've never got into it because I'm a humdrum, run of the mill, boring bastard who just likes, mm -hmm. you know, typical politics. But they've turned me into a conspiracy theorist because whenever you visit these little things that come up in my day to day life, just reading the BBC, and you start looking at it, into it, there is. There is smoke. Where there's smoke, there's fire. There is definitely smoke. So there must mm -hmm. be a fire. And and again, I don't want to get you demonetized. So I'm not going to start talking about the US election type stuff. But all I will say is what is demonstrably factually true. And what is demonstrably factually true is there were hundreds, if not thousands, of individual people who came out and signed affidavits saying, this looked dodgy. And I seen dodgy shit going on. So... Their whole argument is, was there enough of it to change the result? But you can't deny that it happened. Nobody can deny that. They cannot say it didn't happen because it did. There is well, hundreds of people to come I, out and I, say I, I, I go on different um, indicators, if we call them that. And I go on the narrative that you start to hear coming out of people's mouths. And when, like I say, when you see your... I'm just going to say this. I hope it makes sense. It probably won't. But when you see your kind of middle class, um, I don't know, I could call them a Londonite. Does, doesn't necessarily have to be from London. But, you know, these kind of safey, safey type people that they're in tech or they're, you know, they, they do this or they fucking do. When they start coming out with stuff like... Um, I won fair and square, these cliches, these little, like, easy off the tongue, fair, yeah. oh, they can't handle that. It's like immediately you see where the, 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 the intelligence services have been in there, dropping those little earworms into people, knowing that the people will just repeat them without doing any research, you know? It's like the old, yeah, but he's a brutal dictator. <laughs> 45 yeah. minutes. We're all going to get killed oh. in our beds. 40, 45 minutes. Don't start me on that because um, Tulsi Gabbard's my favourite US politician. The only one I went to see when I was out there was Tulsi. I went to um, see her at a rally at LAX. It's not too far from where I was living. Shook her hand and said hello. Marched over like and grabbed her hand. She looked a bit confused. <laughs> but I was like, how are you doing? Because I really like her. Who, and um, who, who was it, Matt? Tulsi Gabbard is a senator from Hawaii in the United States. And she is... Um, what would you call her? She's a rebel. She, she's a Democrat, yeah, but she's constantly disagreeing with the current Democrat headshed because she thinks for herself. And again, like you and I, we don't have to agree on everything, but at least have people on who are be friendly with people who think for themselves. And Tulsi, fantastic, she does. And the one thing they started getting her with was because she did what any responsible politician did and had a chat with Assad when it looked like we were going to invade Syria. And she was like, is this a good idea? And the powers that be, you know, the people that run the world have been saying, oh, my God, she's an Assad apologist. And I was like, if you say the word Assad apologist, I instantly think you're an imbecile because on the face of it, it doesn't make any sense. Kennedy met Khrushchev. All of the people throughout history have met people. Neville Chamberlain met Hitler. Doesn't mean Neville Chamberlain is Hitler. It's so demonstrably stupid. And the, the, every time anyone brings up Tulsi, 
morons on the left go. She's an assert apologist. It's like, no, yeah, yeah. She went and had a chat with him because she wanted to stop a war. Do you not think it's it's the same thing with veterans, though, isn't it? When they talk about Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. He's IRA. It's like, no, he, he... I agree. I agree. I, I, I just thought, like, wasn't the guy trying to be the peacemaker? That's what, that's how it came. It did, I didn't think he was supporting the bombing of the English mainland or blowing up he women wasn't, and no. children. I, I hate Jeremy Corbyn, um, but he, he objectively isn't in the IRA and he doesn't support killing innocent people. Mm. You can make many claims about him. That's not one of them. Um, this is what I was getting you is that I just can't stand people who don't do basic research. When you say things like that, oh yeah, Tulsi was an assert apologist. It doesn't mean anything. You're just spewing out a few words. And if you say to someone, go on then tell me why she's an assert apologist. They don't know anything. Like the amount of people who you ask them to elucidate and they go, uh, they don't, these people don't know where Syria is. They don't know who Bashar Assad is. They don't know he was educated in Europe. Um, they don't know that if we invaded toppled him and imposed another regime. The regime is probably going to be worse than the one that's currently in charge. 500,000 innocent people are going to die and Assad's wife's going to get staked to the floor and shagged to death by 50 madmen with AK-47s. And somehow the left are the ones going, oh yeah, she's an Assad apologist. Is that what you want to happen then? It's something I've got no time for after deploying so many times. It is it, As a soldier, you really try and do your homework on this stuff. And, and that really infuriates me when they say she's an Assad apologist. Nobody calls Neville Chamberlain a Hitler apologist. They might say that he was, um, well, they say the opposite done. They say he went too far to meet him and, and allowed him to take liberties. But a, a leader's job is to try and keep people safe. And if you're just going to call anyone who meets anyone for a chat in an attempt to evade a war an apologist, like it's an insult, I'm sorry to say you have the IQ of a pull along duck because that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And it is a non, how that is an insult is beyond me. It's their job to do that, to meet people that, that, are, that are awful and try and prevent a war. And again, how many times did bloody um, Cheney and the like meet Saddam Hussein? You've got to do it. It's either have a war or have a chat. There is no third option. And it really does annoy me how the left have somehow turned into the warmongers. We will see if we are bombing the shit out of Syria in three months. And I will, in a large part of me, even though it's a tragedy, I'll piss myself laughing because these lefty arseholes that they've managed to convince to vote for the likes of Joe Biden and the Democrat Party, who's Clinton and the like, the people that run the show, are warmongers and have always been happy to be warmongers because their children never fight in these wars. Mm -hmm. I will love it if we're at war with them in three months' time because I get to say, I told you so. And I'm not going to be fighting in it because I'm old and I've got a kneecap like a, and my uh, shin, my spinal column is like a shin bone. Uh, so I'm not going to be fighting in it. But I bet you we're, we're at war again. And they'll go, oh, well, at least Trump's not in charge. Well, Trump didn't kill 500,000 little babies with bombs. That's going to be them again. Mm. Uh, and it's, it really does baffle me. Obama bombed the shit out of everyone. Like I said, we're living in the post truth era. The left have gone mad and they are so. Um, politically indoctrinated, they will look for any excuse to excuse anything Biden does. So they claim to be peacemakers and, and liberal people, but they're slagging off Tulsi for trying to prevent a war, and they're going to praise Biden when he's bombing the shit out of people and we're killing a few hundred thousand kids in Syria. Like, the world has gone mad. We, we, we really are living in the post-truth era when you've got liberals sticking up for bombing the shit out of people. But that's where we're going to end up. What... Um... So again, you excuse my, I, I won't apologize. I, 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 I'd rather stick pins in my eyes than get into politics. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Right. Fair enough. Um, but can you explain to us, Matt, what, what um, like, can Trump get back? First of all, is there any truth in the notion that this is all, let's not say that letter that we all know the letter, because we get that apparently that's conspiracy to cause dangerous stunts if you say that right which is yeah. I, I get i get i get there's that being involved in a movement could be called a dangerous stunt but but is there any truth in the fact that no this is all part of the plan and it's not over yet he hasn't lost yet right is there any truth in that notion secondly 
can he come back and be president again? Or is it, is it if you don't get your second term, it's game over? Right. Well, um, first of all, he definitely can come back and be president again. The, the whole reason they've ripped up the rule book because they've gone mad is because they want to stop him being able to do that. So the reason they're now trying to impeach the guy, even though he isn't in office anymore, which is absurd, right? It flies in the face of the whole American election system. Like, um, it it's, doesn't even make sense with the Constitution. You don't impeach ex-presidents. You, peach, you impeach current presidents. It's a mechanism to remove dodgy presidents from office. They've just changed the rules because they despise Trump that much. So they want to make it so if they can impeach him now and introduce some rule that would allow them to say he was so corrupt, he's not allowed to ever run again. That's why they're impeaching him. But on the face of it, it's laughable. So I would not expect them to get anywhere with it. I'm pretty sure you need, you need like two thirds of the Senate and they're just going to shoot it down because it doesn't make any sense. And, and where are you going to draw the line in the sand if they do change the rule? Because there's another thing I've talked about, Lords. We constantly, we did it with Brexit. The Americans have done it with Trump. We change the rules on a whim. And then those rules you've changed come back and bite you in the ass. And old conservatives that I look up to, like Roger Scruton, would always say they were conservative because the clue's in the title. It's conserve what we have. And if you're going to make changes, you make tiny, tiny little incremental changes because you have to maintain the integrity of the system. And Tony Blair is another one who just broad sweeping reforms, didn't think about it, introduced all of those laws so you're not allowed to say what you want. We've got state mandated politeness. You've got police going around people's house for mean tweets. It's ridiculous. And it's because they make how, sweeping changes without thinking it through. How can someone, especially someone who's been through a bit of hardship in their life, and by that I'm talking about David Blunkett, right? Because the chap was blind. So it's not like he hasn't had a load of shit you know, yeah. how could he turn out so utterly evil? And that Jack Straw bastard as well. Jack Straw, how can yeah. they be so evil? They were just literally writing into policy anything. Uh, yeah. yeah, they didn't think it through. It well, was, anyway, I'll talk, I've segued and I'll take us back into the UK. Let's stick with Trump. The point I'm making is that they, they are not thinking it through. They're not thinking it through thoroughly and they're making sweeping changes when they shouldn't be. So the, the kind of worms there is if you're going to start impeaching people who aren't even president, what's to stop the Republicans when they get a majority? Because this is what I keep saying about if you make broad sweeping changes, who's to say in 10 years time, you're not going to have a raving fucking lunatic in charge and then he can use all of the shit against you that you passed in the first place, right? So if they're going to change the rules and say, right, we can just impeach an ex-president, what's to stop the Republicans getting a massive majority and going, right, we want Obama impeached, we want Clinton no impeached, we want every, you know, Kennedy, dig him up, impeach him. It doesn't make any sense. So just to cover that question, no, I would be amazed if they manage to stop him being eligible to run again, that's that one done. He, he will be able to run again, I, I guarantee it. Whether or not he will, because he'll be old, it's going to be 2025 at this point, I don't know. But that's not going to happen. The first question, uh, what was the other one you asked me? Whether he can run again was one. What was the other one? Um, just there's, there's a kind of, like let's call it an urban rumour or whatever, that, that it's not over yet, that they, they're still going to un unearth this election fraud and that he's still president. No, that, uh, sadly, I think the 4D chess is wishful thinking on the behalf of Trump voters. Um, you and I both know that ultimately her, uh, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Whoever has the keys on the White House um, door, uh, they're going to stitch it up. I would be absolutely astounded if there's any mechanism back for Trump to retake the White House. There is no way. Uh, I personally think there's a lot of validation to all those claims about electoral fraud. Was there enough to change the result? Who knows? Maybe there was. But you're not going to get... It's not going to happen, right? You know you know yourself about whatever we have minor disagreements about how who runs the world and how all this stuff happens. The people that are running things, you don't get to win. And you don't get to take their hands off the White House doorknob. Not now. So that's not going to happen. I, again, I, maybe I'll be wrong. I would be absolutely astounded. You and I both know the little guy doesn't get to win. As I talked about earlier with Robin Hood, it, that's not going to happen. I would be astounded. We are stuck with Joe Biden for the next four years. 
and he's probably going to make an absolute pig's ear of it. As usual, like I've said, because they're obsessed with identity politics and they're essentially embracing a sort of neo-communist ideology now, it's going to suck for blue-collar Americans. Um, all of the executive orders he started signing, they're all the stuff you'd expect. It's like AOC, the mad mental commie, made a wish list. Made a, she was nine years old, she wrote a gift list for Santa Claus, and Joe Biden is inst instigating the lot. He's Mate, made again, a pathway. You're gonna, you, you're gonna have to forgive me, a a AOC. That's uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, the very, very left left wing um, rising star for the Democrats because she's young and relatively attractive, oh, other than I the teeth. She's just so indoctrinated and brainwashed. She's she's, she's mental. She oh, is I, off I, her box. Um, get they they getting they get targeted by this this Ministry for fucking Truth kind of like. Yeah. Like it is like an old And this is yeah, and this is what I'm saying, right? So now in the post truth era, this is why you're getting a loose coalition of everybody else. Because the irony is the commies have started coming out with this um umbrella, the uh, the victimhood pyramid. Everyone comes into the inter intersectional umbrella because they realized they couldn't win an election. So they said if we start doing identity politics, we can get the lesbians, the Muslims, the Jews, the disabled, the blacks, the browns, anything, put them all in and then we'll win. And what they don't realize is what they've done is created this divide where what's actually happening is everyone is gathering under the umbrella of not a fucking maniac. And people who normally wouldn't really agree on very much are all coming together instead. And the vast majority of people have got no time for this shit. Like, seriously, yeah. go into the streets and ask. He's a sudden social justice one that Dawn Butler, raving fucking lunatic that she is, has started batting on about. Babies don't have a sex. Babies don't have a gender. If you were to ask a hundred, go outside, ask a hundred people in the street, 98 of them would say, what the fuck are you talking about? You raving lunatic. No, a, hun a hundred would say that, mate. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> no, no, not if you're not, not if you get a Guardian reader. I'm telling you, I'm telling oh. <laughs> you. It's a brave new world where they live. And um, the point I'm getting at is there'll be 98 will say what you're talking about. So the opposite is true. We really are living in 1984 because we've got an elite minority who nobody likes and nobody agrees with, pulling all the shots, running the world. Like I said, Sky News, Channel 4, um, the BBC. The general public doesn't agree with these people. We are living in 1984. We've yes, got an elite yes, running this things. This and this the general this. public, right and left, don't agree with them. That's why the Red Wall fell in the North. Northeast people, they don't like Tories but they just despise them slightly less than raving lunatics who want to tell you that if you've got a cock, you're a woman. Uh, and if you've got a minge, you're a big hairy bloke. It, it, the, these people are living in a fantasy land because they are ideologues and they don't know whether up is up and down is down. They've gone radio rental and the rest of the world is ganging up against them. And w the real danger is, I think, in what you're going to get in the United States is they're fixing for a fight because CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington Post, all of the narrative is like it is in England. All of them agree. So they've managed to convince themselves that they're in this huge majority when the corollary is true. So what's going to happen is they're going to be like, yeah, let's have a revolution. And then they're going to realize when, think of how bad it'd be for them in England, BLM and all these sort of types. If you were to put them on one side of a battlefield, the ones who want to throw Winston Churchill's statue in the sea and put on the other side of it, the people that passionately don't want to throw Winston Churchill's statue in the sea, what are the numbers going to look like? So my, my real fear is if things get worse, like I was talking about, you don't get people mobilized when the kids are well fed, when the family is taken care of. But if the economy collapses and people start really feeling the pinch, then you might get large scale civil disorder. And when that happens, that's when you get the lunatics in charge because the lefties never win. And, and like you said, who are you going to get in a fight in England? You're going to get a thousand bourgeois middle class students from Oxford going up against 20,000 bricklayers, plumbers and scaffolders. Who's going to win that one? They haven't got a chance. So I pray. Especially that we keep... if they're identifying as pink unicorns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it won't get them far in a fight, will it? No. Uh, uh, and ultimately, if dialogue fails, like I keep saying, there's only two choices. There isn't a third one. The third one I can only think I can think of is isolation. 
make a colony on the moon. We haven't got the technology. So there's only two options. And the options are have a chat and continue things the way we've done for years or violence. That's all that's going to happen. So we need to bring it back from the brink, remind everyone that we all have to live together and get on with each other and be friends and carry on with the electoral process, really nail things on in the United States and ensure 100% that everyone has faith in the electoral process mm. and bring everybody back from the brink. Because if it, they're trying to instigate a fight and they really better pray they don't get it. Because if they get it, they will lose. It's not looking good at all. That, that If I had to do pick one thing that I think we need to concentrate on with the United States politics, it's convincing the far left that just because they control the radio stations and the TV stations and the, you know, the, the big print media, they aren't in the majority. Uh, and if they're fixing for a fight, it's not going to board well for them. So we need to just to get everyone to walk it back, relax a bit and keep talking because it's really not going to go well if it goes the other way. And I would say the same for the UK, but we are a little bit more, um, maybe it's arrogant to say, I think the UK is a little bit more relaxed. We, our extremes aren't like American extremes, you know. Uh, the La Labour Party and the Tories, they're, they're, they're pretty close, aren't they, compared to the Americans. Uh, we just don't have that. So I'm not really concerned about the UK, but I am concerned about the United States. I think if we get a major political um, economic crisis, people are going hungry, then they get miserable, then they get angry, and then they'll be willing to mobilise. And I think if they don't walk it back, the left, Biden really needs to get on it. It's talking it getting people back around the table, make everyone a cup of tea and calm everyone the fuck down. Because the United States is only 150 years out of a civil war, a major civil war where a million people died, where brother fought brother. We haven't had anything like that in England for centuries. So we aren't in as dire a place, but the Americans definitely are. Mm. The tribalism between Republican and Democrat in the United States is terrifying. And I do think, like I said earlier, it's not the number one reason I moved, but it is in the back of my mind. I do think if they don't calm down and remind themselves that they're all Americans, especially the left, because they're the scary ones at the minute, remind them that these people, these Republicans that you've called evil, that most of them aren't evil. Most of them are just normal people who see things slightly different and think instead of taking a bleep into the darkness, you are, you're better off making tiny incremental changes and just keeping things the way they are. But that is what I worry about in the States. I think we need to uh, bring everybody back from the brink, have a long chat and be friends again because have it's going to go bad. Have a big hug. Yeah, they need to hug it out in the States, most definitely. Matt, let's... Um... Let's finish up chatting about your YouTube channel because that always brings a smile to my face. Um, <laughs> how 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 did it being like in the internet sphere did did it take any kind of shrapnel being moved when you moved to England or is it just doesn't matter? No, nah, I'm not big enough. Am I? I've only got like nearly seven thousand subs, which is great because there's a few hundred people. Whenever I uh, you know log on and do a live feed or anything, I enjoy it. I like socialising with people. Um, I, like I told you, I didn't do it trying to make any money out of it or anything like that. I just did it because I felt as if my voice wasn't being heard. And the only thing I was doing was going on Facebook and Twitter and talking shit to people that don't want to hear it. So I thought instead of, instead of badgering my friends and family, I'll make a YouTube channel and then people can voluntarily listen if they want to. Uh, but it's been going fine. Yeah, I enjoy it. I've got a good little community. Um, it took a hit when I moved because I couldn't make content for about a month because Virgin appears to be run by... Uh, Stevie Wonder's in charge of installations for Virgin. It was a nightmare getting it squared away. Uh, other than that, I'm doing oh, all right, yeah. Did you have the super fast broadband thingy, me, Jake, yeah? Yes, yeah, snail speed. <laughs> yeah, the, um, we were really lucky there, mate. The guy came round and he said, you're either going to be lucky or you're not. I need to look in your front drive or something, right? And he got his screwdriver out, lifted up one of these little flap thingy, me, jigs, and he went, you're lucky. And apparently down here, they piggyback off some old, like, do you remember when the TVs first started deregulating and all these, you know, you got your first random service came up that if you wanted to access it, they came around and put a fucking great box on your wall or something, right? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Some, some big techno shit yeah when um, it when it first went from f uh, four channels to yeah. bsb and sky and all that but type of apparently thing. that technology 
they can utilize that to run the super fast broadband on. So if, if, if your house had that back in the day, which obviously ours did, not, 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 not that we were here then, um, then they can just tap straight into that and you get your super fast broadband. But I, I do feel, you know, you prof then I didn't, I yeah, had a nightmare. Either yeah. way you have that down, they expect you to be offline for, I, th I think we were all right. I don't think we were offline for too long, but there's usually a week where you're offline, but luckily I've got un unlimited data on the phone, so I can just piggyback off that, right? Oh yeah, it works all right with five and 4G, doesn't it? If you have 4G, it's like 100 megabytes per second, I think it can go up to. Well, so I, I just you can do that. I just connect through my data connection on the phone and then I hook my computer up to the, that. I've, I've only had to do it a couple of times, but it is handy. Um, I'll have to figure out how to do that. I was like, yeah, I've been told you can do it and I didn't look into just, it. You just got a button on there that says hotspot and you turn it on as a hotspot and it just becomes a hub. Then you, you click on your computer button and it says, you know, what do you want to connect to? You go, that fucker, the hot spot. Ah, right, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to figure that out for when I'm for mowing my internet's down. I've heard it works. But um, no, the channel's gone fine. Uh, it was great talking to you again. I always enjoy having a chat with a fellow bootneck. Um, one who's, despite the name, more angry than I am. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping I might calm down a bit, but it's just... <laughs> I'll be honest. It's like, I feel I see it all, Matt. If I was honest, I, I just, I, it, it, I just, once you, it, it, I, I know I keep going on about it like a boring old man, but once, once you, you take the red pill, once you take the red pill, well, you can't it, go it, back. But it's more than that, mate. You won't get many commentators that talk about the money system. They just don't get it. They all talk about like, if we could fix parliament, we could fix the Senate, we could fix vote. You know, we, we, we could do that. We could put, it's like, no, no, no. All of that is secondary. Primary, the primary evil in the world, right? It's the money system. It's, 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 it's not just the usury, which under biblical terms is an illegal, you know, the, the lending of money and charging interest is, a, is has always been recognized as a, a, like a law against humanity, right? Because mm. what you're effectively doing is, giving an elite group of men might be women but let's just call them sick men that the ability to enslave mankind and that is what's happened and when you understand how what what should have been a fair system of exchange so it's like matt you come and paint my my wall because you're really good at painting i'll come around and fix your door next week right oh hang on i can't come and fix the door oh i'll tell you what i'll do I'll give you three shelves. That's an acknowledgement that that much work, you know, you did three hours painting, that's three shelves, right? That's all it was. There was no like, I'll tell you what, Matt, if you do three hours painting, I'm going to give you three shelves. But what I want you then to do is, I'm actually going to give you five shelves, but I want you to give me back seven, right? And you can pay that back over two, you know, over 24 months. Um, yeah. And, trapping oh, people in oh, death this. And, by, and by the way i'm going to make myself a little machine and i can actually make seashells as <laughs> many of the fuckers as i want <laughs> yeah and i'm a big rich bastard that, that and then what 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 it's done in essence is it's put a value it's put a power value on something that should just be a simple exchange you scratch my back i'll scratch yours if i can't do it matt i'll give you three shells that just means i still owe you for the door or if I can't do it, you can give them three shells to someone else. They'll come and paint your door for you, right? Well, that's why the economy is going to be totally fucked, isn't it? Because they call it quantitative easing because it sounds better. But basically, they've been printing fucking money yeah. because of this. They've shut the economy out for a year. And there's going to be hell to pay when we have to pay the piper there. The misery from the lockdown is going to make COVID look like a cakewalk. Definitely. Oh, oh, oh massively. Definitely. Um, like I said, though, Chris, instead of getting ragged about it, this is what I do. Bootneck, we have the strength of mind. It's just do your very best to look after your nearest and dearest, your friends and your family. And there's no point in getting ragged about it because we are only men. We, the power we wield is very small. Um, I, like I said, I have a good ability to segregate that in my mind and just think, you know what? The world's going to shit. Fucking millions of people are going to suffer as a result of this. But I'm going to do my best practice 
and take every precaution I possibly can, stay fit, eat clean, look after my nearest and dearest, save what money I've got. You can only do your best. And if yes. you do that, hopefully we can ride out the storm. And sadly, but humans ultimately, we, we look inwardly. Sadly, all the people that suffer as a result, I'm not going to be amongst the worst casualties of that. But I do think you've just got to try and teach people that, like self-reliance, even though the world's unfair, even though the system's rigged, you can still mitigate a lot of it if you're really switched on and you focus like you do with your physical fitness and stuff and you can mitigate the damage as best you can. Right? And I think that is that is a more empowering message, I think, what I try to tell my followers um, rather than just ranting all the time, which I do do for comical effect. But I, I do think you can mitigate. We, we're not master of our own destiny anymore and there's evil people that are fucking up the world. But if you as an individual do everything you can to stay laser focused and stay fit and stay healthy and look after your own and talk to your friends and make sure you're there for an emotional support for people, you can get through it. And I just wish we could reach everyone and tell them that same thing because you, you, know, you can't. There's going to be casualties as a result of this lockdown and it's going to be devastating for millions of people. And all you can do is encourage those you know and those that listen to you to really do your best and stay focused and stay switched on and, and deal with it as best you can. But there's rage, uh, impotent rage. That sucks. Comical rage is even good because you give people a laugh, cheer people up. This type of thing's good. I've enjoyed talking to you, but that's the message I'm trying to get out there now. I think we're in for a rough time the next couple of years. There's going to be a lot of suffering and we've just got to stay focused and really do our best to keep people's spirits up, keep ourselves fit in mind and in body, and hopefully get through it with stiff upper lips and stoicism, like we Brits are famous for, right? Yes. Well, I can actually take it one stage further. I'm in chats with a guy called Mike McCarthy. Um, anyone listening might have seen, he's the guy who came on my podcast. He jumped off the Empire State Building. He's a nutcase. He did, he did have a parachute, but it got caught on a traffic, <laughs> got caught on a traffic light, so he got hung, <laughs> hung up. Right. Well, at least it opened. I thought you were going to say something much worse yeah. than that. Well, while the police were there trying to arrest him, his mate pulled up in a van, and he, he, his mate got, he jumped on the van roof, and his mate drove off. <laughs> it's just funny. But anyway, <laughs> Mike, Mike's actually, uh, he's forming a group called Veterans for Action because he's just sick of this shit, and he wants to go after the, you know, let's call it the heart, the the heart of it, um, the elite. So. Yeah, it will be interesting to um, have. I'm going to have a chat with him next week and see what his his sort of plans are. I at least he well, I'll tune in. I always like listening yeah. to you. Well, he, his theory is, you know, if you're a veteran, you have the skills to be a force for good in the world. You know, but the trouble is because everyone's watching the left hand and not not the right, or the right and not the left. They the the, the their loyalties and stuff gets misguided, doesn't it? And they end up actually supporting the enemy <laughs> yeah no you're right um it, i am cognizant of that right with my own background like um i think i've told the story when i deployed to northern ireland uh, for a, for a couple of years when i got back i had, i had an irrational dislike for irish people even though i am a part irish because i'm from up north and we all are mm -hmm. um you know my great granddad was irish uh, but i had an irrational dislike of them and um, as you mature, you realize it's because of your conditioning. You know, everyone out there was rude to me or, or, or horrible. You know, I was like, I'm taking a knee outside a post office and some woman's like, you fucking Brit, like giving me loads of shit. So your reaction as a stupid human is to hate them back. Um, and I'm certainly guilty of doing it with, like I said, what we discussed earlier, Islamic community. A tiny fraction of them embrace extremism. And yet part of my brain occasionally does go, want to rail back at them because of my military experience. And I do think that's something that we, like I said, you've got to try and educate people about because none of us are perfect. And we all have our, like I said, stupid adrenal gland that's too big and our prefrontal lobe that's too small. And, uh, and we do, we, we're rash and we're quick to anger and we're quick to judge. And I think keeping a hold of your emotions in that respect is important for your well-being as well, right? Because like I said, I call myself the angry boot, but I don't think I'm particularly angry. Uh, and it's important not to be. So, you know, that it's all about, as I was talking about, fixing the state. Just getting people to walk back and think, really, what's important in life, right? Things are going to go tits up and things are going to get hard. But if you uh, if you just stay focused and you stay mindful of what's important, you can, you can get through it. Uh, and I think that that's a message that we should be promoting to everybody, right? It's, we can do it. 
We need to have a can-do attitude. Our forebears dealt with far greater than this. With, with, with the people who lived through the blitz, uh, and we can definitely do this. And I, and I think that's a good message to to end on, really, right? Yes, you're trying to get rid of me, aren't you, on my own, on my own podcast? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm desperate for a piss, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yes, you pick up these signs when you sit in a chair like this for as long as I... <laughs> Matt, lovely chatting to you. Um, don't stay on the line. Let's just let's just do a big farewell, um, and then we'll just cut the cord, and that's it, right? There's no hanging. There's yeah, no- we don't like emotional goodbyes. Hey, but- there's yeah. no like pushing the off record button and then having a chat for another ten minutes. All right, this is all right. This is going to be the big one. But anyway, friends at home. Matt, you can find him. Just type "angry bootneck" into YouTube. What is quite funny is. I've noticed people are actually typing the Angry Bootneck YouTube into YouTube, right? (laughs) Just need to point out that YouTube bits are necessary, folks. He he is the Angry Bootneck on YouTube. Amazingly, there is only one. Amazingly. (laughs) It just, it makes me sad to think people have obviously typed the Angry Bootneck YouTube into YouTube, unless unless those keywords just come in from the internet or something from the search (laughs) engines. Um, so, yeah, come on, go and visit Matt's channel. He will bring a smile to your face. And I'll put your social media underneath our video, Matt. And yeah. um, give my best wishes to the north of England. I will. I'll, uh, we'll do this again sometime soon, I'm sure. Take care yeah. of yourself, Chris, all right? Yeah, and let's, uh, let's hook, hook up um, at some point in, the, in this year, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. I'll probably be up your way. I'm going to try and get a camper van and come and do a podcast tour. <laughs> so, oh, quality. All right. Yeah. Come up north. Brilliant. All right. Take care of yourself, Chris. I'll see you very soon. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks to everyone man. at home. See, see you later. soon. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. Bye.